So I think for the young artists right now, it would feel like the best time to be writing music te technologically. And I think for a lot of artists, maybe the most confusing time for them to figure out how to release it and how to get their stuff heard. But oh, we're going to get you on a cadence. We're going to hit that algorithm. We're going to get your numbers up. That would have destroyed me. I would advise us doing the opposite. Screw the cadence. You focus on the quality of your work. Do people, can they remember it? Do they want to come back to it? Those two things transcend the whole algorithm conversation. This is Daniel Eck. He's the CEO of Spotify, and just a couple short years ago, his response to the current state of music streaming was that artists just aren't releasing enough music and they aren't releasing it fast enough. He went on to say that basically the album is dead, singles are the new king, and you have to be constantly cranking them out along with content and constantly engaging with your audience. This way, maybe you won't get lost by the endless wave of music that's being released on his platform every single day. So basically what he's saying is that the problem for artists is that there's too much music coming out and the solution is to put out more music even faster. It's almost like it's just a numbers game to these corporations, like they've created a system to put us on the hamster wheel and are complaining that we aren't running fast enough. <laughs> that couldn't be it. Now, if you're a creative person, you probably understand that this just isn't the way art works. And I actually think the worst thing you can do as an artist especially who's just starting out is to climb willingly onto that hamster wheel because that wheel belongs to people who don't value your music at all. I mean, they literally don't value it. I recently had the opportunity to talk with someone with more experience in this area than I have personally, my good friend and well-established ambient artist, Tony Anderson. And unfortunately because Spotify exists and fortunately because it exists, we can see numbers attached to songs. And that's new. And I do want to acknowledge when I started this process of releasing, there were no metrics. There was no YouTube to get distracted by. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There was, I mean, SoundCloud, but that was conversation based. I didn't have to deal with the pressure people are dealing with right now that right out of the gate, it's really not about your work. It's about the view count, the stream count. And I'm seeing the Zoomers, which that's what I call Gen Z. Sorry, guys, but you're Zoomers. I love you. I'm a millennial, I'm a dumb millennial, but you're a Zoomer. The Zoomers are all dealing with crazy mental health crises after one or two album releases, right? Mm. How crazy is this? So a lot of the posts are like, hey, I did an album or I had a single and it either didn't do well or it did well. And both of them cause an equal amount of mental distress. So they can't even get the next single out of the gate, let alone an album. So it's a level of fragility that's caused by all the noise, all the chaos, and all the comparison. I, I don't envy it at all, but I do know the principles that you and I employ to write music are the same for them as they are for us. Mm. I just, if I can be really blunt, I feel like they don't want to hear it. See how I sound like an 80-year-old man who fought in the Korean War? The best thing you can do for your work is to focus on your work. It's the only thing that you control. I have this conversation on cycle. You need time, you need patience, you need to find your voice. That takes time and it requires patience and you need to be willing to work another job to finance your musical habits. And if you can find your voice, if you can find your voice, you will not have to market your stuff at all. People will come and find you. If you're just starting to make music, then this isn't really what we're talking about. Because I think you actually do need to just iterate a lot. You need a lot of repetitions to figure out what your voice even is. And you'll learn a lot more by trying and failing than by listening to some guy on the internet. But you can make a lot of music without releasing all of that music. This is that time in the lab that is really valuable and actually a really wonderful thing. But I think adding the pressure of it having to hit certain numbers on a streaming platform as you're just trying to figure out what your voice is can be really detrimental to you as an artist. It's a tough roller coaster to jump on immediately, especially if you lack confidence of what you're even trying to say artistically. If things don't go well, you're more likely to get really depressed about it. And if things do go well, then you're more likely just to write stuff like whatever you just did that was successful and got you those cheap dopamine hits. And that's also bad for your development as an artist because then you sometimes won't experiment with the things that you might actually want to say. 
I don't think you can build something that lasts and is sustainable without building the foundation first. And this is why I say that marketing with no substance behind it is not going to work. It might in the short term, we see people sell inferior products all the time and they may in fact sell, but they will not last. They will not stand the test of time. And when it comes to art, I think most of us as artists are trying to build something that has some timeless qualities to it. These are exactly the kinds of concepts that I talk about compositionally in my free ebook, which you can download in the description if you're so inclined. So I think for the young artist right now, it would be, it would feel like the best time to be writing music te technologically. And I think for a lot of artists, maybe the most confusing time for them to figure out how to release it and how to get their stuff heard. Because the expectation, sadly, right now, is that if I release it, it's only good and it was only successful if it's heard right now. Most of the music that is in circulation on my Spotify right now came out seven to 10 years ago, okay? That's what we want as artists. We want our stuff to have a timelessness to it, but we have to have the patience. We can't freak out. We can't worry about going viral. We can't be looking at Instagram numbers because the algorithm changes so consistently. You know, my channel's kind of become more education-based recently um, because mm -hmm. I realized at some point that I had kind of a unique blend of having the classical background. And that's what that's all about, right? It's like, what are these concepts that have already stood the test of time? Yeah. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And in a lot of cases, musically speaking, we can incorporate those things into more modern languages musically, and yeah. uh, it still works. You know, it still makes, mm. it still sets uh, music apart that does that, I believe. Before the pandemic, I think there were, I think I remember hearing that there were less than 10,000 songs a day coming out, something like that. It was pretty moderate. From last time I checked, we got up into the hundreds of thousands of songs coming out per day, okay? So, Let's also be fair about the fact that we have more people releasing than ever before. How do you combat that? You write more precise music that is a better expression of your internal world. So instead of focusing then on quantity of work, you focus on quality. This is true of uh, painters. I've learned this from painters. If a painter does too much work and then they die, their work is devalued because their work is too common. How does that not apply to music? It absolutely applies to music. Like when a chef opens up too many restaurants, he loses his potency. She loses her potency. We stopped going to eat there because they got in over their skids. You know what I mean? So like in music, we've been told, write and release consistently, get on the algorithm, always have something new coming out. This is one of the things labels do that just destroy artists' careers. Like they establish a cadence. I remember hearing from uh, a label who will not be named right now saying, Tony, your, your biggest weakness is cadence. We need you on a cadence. So if you sign with us, we're going to give you a loan. I was like, I don't need that because I'd rather go to a bank. Because if I took a loan from a bank and I paid it back, I would still own my master's in publishing. So no, we're not doing that. But oh, we're going to get you on a cadence. We're going to hit that algorithm. We're going to get your numbers up. That would have destroyed me. I, I would advise us doing the opposite. Screw the cadence. You focus on the quality of your work. Do people, can they remember it? Do they want to come back to it? Can they remember it? Do they want to come back to it? Like those two things transcend the whole algorithm conversation. This constant pressure to always be releasing <laughs> puts us in a state of fear. Fear that we'll be left behind if we don't keep up with what everyone else is doing that we see online. Fear that that means that our work isn't good if we don't get the same numbers that someone else gets. And in order to make up for that fear, they tell us just to throw more at the wall and hope something sticks. Fear is cancer for creativity. And this fear is compounded by the fact that we're immediately met with all of this information, all of these numbers that supposedly tell us whether or not our release was successful. We get hung up on that. We're no longer free. We're no longer creating and writing from a place of freedom. We're writing from a place of fear. I can hear when I'm afraid or when I'm distracted or when I'm spread too thin or when I overbaked something or underbaked something, so to speak. Usually for me, I layer the crap out of my songs and destroy the intimacy. That's what I, that's what I love to do is destroy mm. something by smothering it. But we can't focus and we're not free and mobile when we're up here in the algorithm conversation.
So maybe the solution, like Tony suggests, is to step out of that swiftly quickening current for just a moment. I think from the bank we can see things with a bit more perspective. And that perspective is really something that sort of intuitively makes sense to all of us, I think, and that's in order to build something worth having that will last and stand the test of time, it's going to take time. These things don't just happen. How comfortable or uncomfortable would you be knowing there's maybe like a three to five year minimum that I'm seeing at the fastest end and maybe 10 years on the long end. Oh my God, I can't do 10 years. Not, you know, anyone who's like, I'm going to get on TikTok. I'm going to get it just, you know, cause you're not on TikTok. So I'm going to do it and I'll bypass all the stuff and not a single, like I checked the other day. I actually did check just, you know, are these people still releasing music and they bowed out all of them in 2022. So the patience thing is what you have. And it's what I've had built into me, which is think, think long-term and also think ownership. So long-term time frame is one. And then ownership of your assets is, is second. This is kind of an aside, but one of the reasons I actually encourage people to not get into a lot of film scoring where they have to get up, give up ownership of the master and publishing. Cause of course the master is like the pre-built sandwich. It's everything together. The publishing is just the ingredients of the sandwich that you can use to make a new sandwich. But owning both of these is, that's your long-term wealth. I only make a living right now because I never gave my sandwich away to anybody. And I've had people ask for it, so to speak, over the years. I remember I did a film score for some people that I, I really love. And when they came back to me a few years later, um, they asked, they, they wanted to pay the same amount, but they wanted equity of the songs. And I just said, absolutely not because that's not how this works. Like if you want me to work my best, I'm incentivized by owning what I make. So I'd actually take a lower fee if you'd let me own what I want to make. And right now, as we're seeing larger corporations go around and try to scoop up people's catalogs, and I see friends of mine selling, I understand why people need to. But effectively, what you're doing is you're selling a living, breathing ecosystem, which is what you're building right now. You know, we may not be in the same place categorically in life at the same moment, but you're building an ecosystem underground in the soil in its nutrient density that is going to cause a lot of things to grow over the years. That's that's what we're looking at. We're looking at building a slow burn under the soil. Anything that's above the soil is great, but it's all a flash in the pan. So I think it's the time frame. How long can you let the soil rest? How long can you let the wine decant? Like It's like feeding a starter for sourdough bread. The more you feed it over the years, it's going to taste better every time you bake a loaf. How long do we have to wait? Can we be patient waiting for wealth to come later? And second, are we willing to own our assets? Meaning we're only going to take jobs and take work where we get to own our work. And that actually sadly means a lot of us cannot sign with record labels. And that's painful for a lot of people because the label is over here like a bank um, saying, we'll loan you money, help get you on the road, help get a tour going, help schedule you out, get you marketed, do all the things. But man, not only do they need that money recouped, they're going to own the master in publishing, or at least a, a portion of it. Art is highly personal. And if you make things for the purpose of expressing those personal innermost thoughts and feelings, then it can be really difficult, especially if those innermost thoughts and feelings and expressions don't line up with what a mass market wants to hear. So in this case, we may have to realize that our art is for us and it's not going to resonate with as many people as we might expect. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't make those things. In fact, I think it's incredibly important that you do make those things. I think most active listeners can really tell when you've poured yourself into your work. And I think that those are the listeners that we all really want anyway. Much more valuable to have a hundred of those than hundreds of thousands or millions of passive listeners from a playlist. Most of the time, the problem is on our end, okay? The problem is the song wasn't right when it went out or it was experimental. And so therefore mm -hmm. you're not gonna have a mass market. Like when I did the 9-11 yes. album called Debris, like who's gonna want to listen to an album uh, that is ambient and slightly orchestral that has sounds of a terrorist attack going on behind it? You know what I mean? Like. I can answer that for you. Nobody wants to listen to that. My friend Bruno, who does um, programming and playlisting at Apple, hard pass. 
You know what I mean? Like it, <laughs> dude, I had a hard time getting the 9-11 memorial staff to listen to it, right? So does that mean that there's something wrong with the algorithm or there's a conspiracy? No. It means that the thing I was most passionate about was about me. It was about self-expression. It was about me saying, I want to invite the listener into an experience of 9-11. I want to honor the victims. I want to create something uh, with gravity from that day. And guess what? That was only for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really proud of it. I'm glad at how it turned out. It took almost a year to get done, but it was a hard pass for most of my listeners. Now, that didn't discourage me, but I certainly did not blame the algorithm. I thought, in this case, I think the music's right, meaning I think I worked it enough, but not too much. I think tracks like Debris and Infinite, I go, okay, we definitely got those. Those feel good. Did it deserve to live? Yes. It was that meaningful to me. And I've heard directly from family members of people who were lost on 9-11. Then we get to the third conversation. Does that mean it's going to succeed up here? Absolutely not. Am I offended by that? No. Am I sad? Yes. Because I'm an artist. And I want the stuff that I work really hard on to be appreciated by other, other people. But in that case, that was self-expression. I think some of us are doing stuff, self-expressive purposes. And then we're freaking out about the algorithm before the song's even out. But like, we don't even know our audience out there yet. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't freak out. I'm not saying we shouldn't be afraid. What I am saying though, is that none of that is helpful in making our music as deep and meaningful and powerful and potent as it could be and should be. So even though the art itself might get lost in all of the external noise today and all of these voices telling us that we have to just keep pumping stuff out to feed the content machines, the art, the work, the music itself is still the foundation. Build that. Build the foundation. Understand, though, that it may take longer than you expect. And the things that you love the most may never be loved by the mass market. That's fine. That's good. As artists, that's what we're we're wanting, we're wanting to be seen and heard. And for a lot of us, if we didn't have anyone in our families or in our relational circles, whoever stopped us and said, I really think you're good at this and I really want you to do it. And I really think the world needs this. If we didn't have that, we're gonna be looking for it from the algorithm. We're gonna be looking mm -hmm. at it for it uh, from the amount of people who watch our reels on Instagram. But if we have a deep internal conviction and a long-term view, both paired together, the deep internal conviction saying, I know I am on this earth to do this stuff, whether or not it's commercially viable. And then number two, I believe in the time horizon being longer. Like I, I'm, I'm in this to make timeless stuff that may not be appreciated during my lifetime, but I believe it needs to be in the world. Those two paired together, that, that's it. That's it for me. That's the life of an artist who's producing music in the year 2023 and beyond. The conversation about should we even do this because we're not sure that this streaming service is even, you know, going to be viable. Yes, you should still do it. The fact that we're even considering the people who run these huge conglomerates and corporations is a distraction from the process that's necessary in us that needs to get out. So Will we all go through seasons of feast and famine? Absolutely. Like nobody in the music industry has a linear journey all the way up. And if they tell you that, they are completely lying. Even someone like Taylor Swift has not had that occur. But I can tell you that um, it's the beautiful rhythms and it's the learning from them instead of the freaking out and going into survival mode. If we can learn that, like to me, we can regulate and learn in the process that's that's gold so my encouragement to artists especially right now i think the easiest frequency to get on is the agreement that everything's corrupt everything's broken everything's slated against us the, the world's going to hell uh the country's falling apart people just say this it's it's complete groupthink now i'm not just i'm not saying that the stuff happening around us is not causing deep and seismic pain in the lives of people who are losing families and loved ones. What I am saying is it is the job of the artist to produce beauty and to bring that into the world. That's your job. You did not sign up to have a pre-existing streaming service that could just catapult your stuff out into the world. 
Your job is to get deep and granular. That's what artists do. We don't sit here and complain. We don't blame systems and structures. We create. And I get it. Right now, it's easy to do that because we see band camp selling. We see these signals out there of things changing. But our job is always the same. And so my suggestion to all of us as artists is to turn the noise down outside. Our job is to create the music so that people have a companion in the midst of their pain, right? That's that's the job, right? And most of us are doing that. We're trying to make music that connects with people. What's more connective than a world that's in pain, right? But we don't have that conversation often, do we? Why? And this is where I have compassion. We don't have many mentors and examples, we don't have a lot of people running YouTube channels on social media who are saying that. We have a lot of people who are trying to scare us or who are adding shame and guilt on top of that, right? I think we're looking in the completely wrong direction right now. I think we're looking up and out. We're not looking in. We're not quiet. We're not centered. We're not writing from that place often. And I don't say we like we're all missing it. Maybe I should be saying me. Am I looking internal? right? Am I getting quiet? Am I looking to bless the world through my work? Because we're in the service industry. This is the, this is where I'll land this plane. Our, we are in the service industry. I have been extremely, extremely blessed and lavished on in my career monetarily. I am not going to not, I'm not going to dismiss that. I am still doing the same thing I've always done. I have not changed an iota of the method and, and the direction that I'm aiming my work at. That's what I'm getting at. Some of us are going to earn and, and we're going to benefit monetarily from that. Others of us are not. Does that mean the gift is not valid because there's not huge financial incentive behind it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So when we, when we correlate the gift that we've been given and its perceptive success with a monetary value, it, it's already bankrupt. The whole conversation's over because no one can ever win that argument. If we're thinking it wasn't good because it didn't stream, that's where we get internal, we shut down, and our career ends in two to three years, right? But if we can pass that hurdle and go, it may just not be now, and it may, might be in the future, we have to keep that hope alive, right? And so I hope artists are not thinking, oh, I, Tony's saying I'm going to be one of the people that doesn't. No, we have to keep the hope alive. But the hope is if we keep doing this in one direction, maybe one day it will be discovered. Maybe it is through a service that doesn't exist yet. So I want to encourage people, it can happen. It can happen. It does happen. It still will happen. But if you're one of those artists that doesn't financially benefit from it, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It might just mean your music is not for a mass market or a commercial market. <laughs>